Ross. Hey. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks a lot. Firstly, anyone who's watching, please, we are in a very slouchy, soft room. Yeah, very loudy. Um, and yeah, by the end of it, we're going to be pretty much horizontal. Um, I feel a bit like Jacob rees Mogg in that meme, <laughs> who got told to sit up straight or whatever. Um, Ross, you're here from Next Energy Capital, and we'd like to have you on. Um, who are you, Ross? What is Next Energy Capital and why are we talking? And what on earth are you guys doing in the battery world? Yeah, great. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm Ross Gray. I'm Managing Director of Next Energy Capital in the UK. Uh, so I look after all of the investment activities and the operations of our portfolio that we've built over the last decade in the space. Uh, a little bit about me to start, I guess. So I, I started off my career um, in Exxon Mobil as an analyst. I met a guy called Rex Tillerson, who then went on to be Trump's energy advisor. Yeah. So you, you can imagine the character. Um, he inspired me strangely into the renewable energy space and and from that point on i was always looking to get you know migrate my, great, my he, career into that you space. said i don't want to be like him i want to do renewables or exactly he was that. talking about renewables and so he did this kind of he did this presentation to a select few of us that said this is energy production at the moment and this is how oil coal gas currently are being refined and this is what energy demand looks like over the next 20 30 years and this is how we think you know that that same production yeah. is going to change and then there's this little sliver of renewables and, and I thought there's there's an opportunity there from an, like an economic opportunity in the future, but also, you know, a better way than, than doing what we currently do right now. So it inspired me on a couple of different fronts, really. It's pretty nuts, right? Because Exxon, we're already digressing here, right? But Exxon have gone pretty hard at the oil and gas thing when yeah. BP and Shell of of diverting and Total are deciding... Well, we're gonna, we want to be a renewables company in the future. Yeah. Exxon said, no. Yeah, yeah. We do what we do. <laughs> we we're do old what school. we do. Yeah. We're old school. Um, I guess you've got to respect a bit of grit there, but I mean, I, 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 it's not the side I want to be on. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> that, that's exactly the decision I made as well, was, was just like, this is not the ship I want to continue to sail on. I want to go the other way. And there's a lot to be really impressed about that organisation. I mean, the way it refines and transports and delivers with like minimal spillage and all the rest of it is, is impressive, but but it also isn't the right side of the legacy that, that I want to leave behind me. So, so and hence the migration. You, what, what, what are you? Are you an economic, uh, economics person, a mechanical no, engineer? A... I'm a problem solver by trade. Yeah. So I, I've done, you know, transformation, change consulting and, and various other um, kind of managerial consulting type, type roles in the past. And really I got into renewables to help it scale. So it was to find what the barriers were, help mitigate them and then commercialise it. So... Yeah got back in, 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 you know, 20, what was it, 2009, 2008, um, into the solar space. And, mm -hmm. and really back then it was a, it was a tree hugging decision. So it was really early doors and the things like the feed-in tariff in, in solar. Um, so we were fighting for a conversation around, around PV in, in every avenue. So with the financiers, yeah. with, with the politicians and so on. And I've seen that, that mature over the last decade to being a real core part of the energy mix. And that's been super exciting. It's been really challenging as well, right? Solar as an industry has a habit of making it look relatively easy. It definitely isn't. I'm going to ask you about this later. Yeah, let's just bank Great. that question. Yeah, yeah, happy yeah. to come back to that. Yeah, so, so it's been really nice to see the latest kind of conversation around energy security where that conversation has really shifted now to say, well, actually, we get that solar is an important part of the mix and a mix is definitely important, right? I'm not just backing one technology class. Um, and it can be an increasing part of that energy mix and we see the deliverability of it and all, and all those kind of good things that we've been saying for the last decade. And, yeah, yeah. and it's been really satisfying to, to realise that. So over that 10 years since I joined Next Energy, or it's 10 years next year, uh, we listed a thing called the Next Energy Solar Fund, which is our big um, big listed long-term holder of, of solar assets in, in the UK and beyond. Um, and we've built around a gigawatt of, of, of assets in that over over the period of time. So we're, we're quite a significant so gigawatt generator. gigawatt solar in 10 years? Yeah. That's, pretty, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> given, that's a lot to manage. Given what, the baseline is 15 gigawatts being delivered in the UK today, it's not it's not a bad And sum. so are the, is that one one gigawatt project or is that 110 megawatt project? No. It's 100 <laughs> of various different shapes and sizes. So we yeah. have everything in there actually from domestic rooftops right the way up to, to you know, 50 okay. megawatt utility scale. Uh, and absolutely everything in between, but but the majority is kind of five, ten megawatts. It, it, the size is stepped down in line with the the, the feeding tariff regime. And let's come back to how you fit in. So what mm. what do you do at Next? So you call it Next Energy, Next Energy Capital, or Next Energy? Which one should I go? So with? Next Energy Group is Next is group. the overall vehicle. We have three pillars to the group. So Next Energy Capital is an investment manager. So we look after the the money on behalf of our institutional investors, um, and then we really. Uh, 
you know, optimize those returns over time. So we're really sourcing all of the M&A activity. We're looking after the operations of the fund and we're, we're maintaining the compliance and all of that good stuff. Um, the second pillar of the vehicle is, is Wise Energy. That's our asset management sister company. It's a key component of what you get with Next Energy. So we've got, you know, a bunch of people spread across the world who look after solar assets only. Um, and they do that in every stage of an asset's life for a whole variety of different sponsors. So we know how these things age over time, which is really important in terms of how, as an investment manager, we then extract maximum value, maximum availability from, from the assets. And, and we're now diverting that into other technologies as well. So we've built this core skill set across those two platforms as a, as a as solar, and then we're diverting that into battery and, and various other um, interesting spaces as well. Can I, can I ask a quick question there? Sorry. Um, mm. uh, I have a I'm going to ask you a question like I'm a five-year-old because I want, I want I want to understand it properly. So, and this is the first time we've had someone on the podcast. To, we're going to talk about batteries, of course, but we're also going to talk a lot about solar today. Sure. So when we say a gigawatt of solar, what does that gigawatt mean? So from from my perspective, we're I view us as an asset yeah. owner. So so really it's a physical gigawatt DC of, of generating capacity. Yeah. Um, and and all of that is is either subsidised or under long term agreements for the sale of of, of power. Um, and so is, that, is that like peak demand across the day? So the sunniest bit of the day, you're going to generate a gigawatt, or is that you've got correct. a gigawatt of connections with? So because so it's 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 a gigawatt of peak. So okay, it's, yeah. it's basically you know sunniest day of the year maximum generation what theoretically can you can you generate it's not quite as straightforward as that because okay. you experience some capping in 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 the summer but but think of it as in if you add all of the capacity of all of the solar modules that are in the ground together you get to that that dc um out output um so and I'm the, the reason we, out, no, no no it's fine I'm, I'm just kind of trying to trying to work out the best way to build the story but you you basically overpower solar so you have a bigger amount of dc than you do an ac grid connection DC being so, direct current before the inverter and AC correct, being yeah. alternating current, which is what the grid is at. And, yeah. and the reason for doing that is obviously solar super efficient in the summer. It's obviously less efficient when irradiance is lower in the winter. So you're trying to take that traditional bell curve that you get with solar and lift the tails because obviously pricing in the winter periods is, is significantly better yeah. than pricing in summer periods and, and, and so on. So economically it makes a whole bunch of sense. To, to work the system a little bit harder and, and to overpower. What it does mean is your traditional bell curve is probably a bit flatter at the top, so you end up capping the performance of the asset, so you're not putting out that full DC capacity in, in summer, you're actually having to limit your inverters a little bit to the to your grid connection size, but it, yeah. makes, it makes it a more efficient system overall. So, um, right, that's an interesting thing you said there. So the tail, so the bell curve, uh, obviously at night there's no solar, and hold on, at night, this is going to be a stupid question. At night, is there no nothing generated from a solar yeah, panel? Nothing generated from there's zero solar. volts. Zero, right zero, now, zero. zero I just wondered whether there, there is some tech that talks moon. about harvesting moonlight. But moonlight, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Sorry, we're, we're a bit early for that. So um, it's up okay. there alongside space in space solar as well, which is a new <laughs> concept on the space horizon. Solar, yes, yeah, yeah that, cool there's there. two words that should yeah. go together more often. <laughs> so, um, what you have to you angle the. Um, the solar panels, you know, I'm gonna, this is how little I understand this. I'm going to come out with lots of like basic cool. words that are wrong here. But I'm, solar panels, right? Is that still, still the word you yeah, use yeah, to describe them? Um, you angle them so you get the optimum irradiance, if you like. Is there an argument to say you angle them more towards the evening peak? Because your price is more attractive later on. And you actually, you're better off... Um, angling them towards, I'm going to take a guess here, the west or the east? So <laughs> no, I can't remember which one it is. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, the methodology is evolving. So technology is changing over time, as you would imagine. Actually, latest technology is, is tracker-led. So, so actually, it's self-optimizing relative to what's going on in, in the environment. So what it moves. Yeah, so, cool. so you, you could get single and dual-axis trackers. So single-axis is obviously just doing the, 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 the one dual is, is, is doing you know, whatever it can to, to, to point directly at the sun. Um, the the traditional kind of fixed methodology is is about re, is about use, utilizing the land parcel as efficiently as possible as well. So you've obviously got top, topography of the land to deal with. You've got shading issues to deal with. What you want is to minimize into row shading. So between one set of modules and the rows behind it, you want to minimize that at your lowest period of, of generation because then as you get to higher periods of generation sun is obviously higher you get less impact uh, on that okay, inter row yeah. so you're balancing a whole load of stuff in there to, to come up with the kind of maximum yield output that you can get from the area you're taking sometimes when i drive past a solar 
farm, solar, solar panel, solar park. People are using the word park, park a lot and, now. Park and farm, yeah. yeah, they do, yeah. Why is park now in vogue? But anyway, so when I drive past one, sometimes I do think that the distance between the, the banks, if you like, of the solar panels is, 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 is wider than makes sense for, for shadowing, but there must be more going on there. Where there, it's access and there, yeah, there, there's there's a whole load of stuff that feed that feeds into that different dynamics. Um, te- I, they've become more power dense as people have changed designs as well. So if you have, again, going into a layer of detail that might be too much, the modules modules are are wired in a way that means that that if you shade at the bottom of a module, they you you effectively take off a a section of the module. So if you think about the squares that run down a PV module that you've seen in in your mind, they are wired yeah. like this. So if you shade the bottom, you get all of those wires covered. If you then mount it in a portrait fashion and you just take the bottom, you're actually just taking that bottom component of the module off. The rest is still able to generate a higher output. Oh, so so you st- you're able to then bring the row spacing together because then if you're shading the bottom end of that next row, it doesn't matter so much. So, so there is a right that, way up that, for a well, solar Well, there panel. is, yeah. So, so theoretically, that, that has evolved into the industry over the last year. So early, early doors, there were a lot of really widely spaced portrait. Then that changed to multiple landscape and now what we're seeing again is is tracker and and you see a whole bunch of different solutions on tracker well every day is a school day yeah it's all good um, stuff eh? sorry back back to next energy so yeah. you guys are like 200 300 people ish are yeah. all around the world what countries are you in how fa- how old is the company how much money does it make or look after all of that stuff give us yeah, the, cool. the top trumps card um, and actually i'll give you the third pillar that i started talking about earlier yeah, when yeah, we, we digress no that's fine um so there's there's about 250 people in in the group at the moment they're spread across all jurisdictions. So we're basically everywhere OECD these days. I look after just the UK business at the moment. OECD um, being? So every kind of Western uh, civilised uh, marketplace yeah. from a financing perspective yeah. is, 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 is OECD. Um, so we, we have assets now across you know Portugal, Spain, Chile, North America and beyond. Um, and, and the team that run that international fund are continuously pushing the boundaries of, of, of how much we've got there. We've got just a little bit under $3 billion under management at the moment. Uh, we were set up back in 2007 by Mike, who's our, who's our CEO and founder. Um, and then uh, we've, you know, we started with with just partner capital, and then we've raised, you know, significant fund, multiple funds uh, over over that time period as well. And we're a combination of of listed fund in, in Next Energy Solar Fund, and then private funds as well. So the private funds are same sorts of investors. So generally speaking, institutional pension fund type investors, but they have different mandates. So so the the, the, the private ones tend to be a bit shorter. So they're looking at a kind of a ten year horizon. The Next Energy Solar Fund is particularly interesting because it's an evergreen vehicle so it's, it's never going to divest these assets it's going to own and operate them for 20 30 40 50 years can i jump into some basics here because i'm sure um it's not clear to me and i'm sure it's not clear to a lot of listeners so a pro- we've got we're talking about funds here so this is next energy capital looking after other people's money and managing it and doing it and, and making a good return from it right and there's two types of funds a private and a public a public one anyone can go and buy those shares on the on the stock Correct. exchange right and a pi- private ones the what not everyone can. Your, it's, your it's pension quite, funds investing. Your pension investing, funds, yeah. right? So, um, but you talked a little bit about duration there. Mm-hmm. So, in a ten-year private fund, do you you raise the money, you get the private money, you buy the assets, and what in ten years do you just sell them all? You sell, sell the whole sell fund? them as a portfolio, or you know, bring the next wave of capital in. Depends on the strategy. There's a whole host of different ways of doing it, but there's obviously a what they call in the industry a, a kind of yield compression in the middle. So you're yes. you're basically building a portfolio of assets optimizing them as, as well as you can, building optionality around it, potentially bringing you know, debt into that equation as well to, to, to increase your returns and so on. And then you're looking to sell that portfolio to the next owner. And, and what's interesting in the renewables market, again, going back to where we started, which is how much this market's matured and become an economic uh, decision, you now see a really hot secondary market for, for portfolio. So, so you are, there are big strategics that are really hungry for taking a big chunk of of um, of long term asset ownership, such as like BP and Shell, have set these massive yeah. targets. They want to own so much renewables, and there's probably a shortage of it out there. So to yeah, buy it all in one in these packages is probably a sensible. Exactly, yeah. And, and if you think about for those guys doing a five million pound transaction is is really painful. It's our you know it's our bread and butter to do something five to fifty million. We can then aggregate that up to a significant portfolio. You know, five hundred million worth. That's a that's a much easier ticket okay. for them to digest. But then a public fund, a public fund's a bit 
bit like a public company, right? You have to yep. do the reporting. Yeah, yeah, you have to be careful what you say publicly if it's not, you know, you can't, you can't have non-public information that's Correct, not, I yeah. um, can't remember the CFA stuff now, yeah. right? It's a long time ago. Um, and you, um, the, the public side of your business, how much is that? Is it half? Is it a quarter? Is it? So um, it's about half in terms of, of, uh, assets under management it's a bit bit less than a bit less than that but 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 call it kind of 50 50 for for the sake of arguments um it's uh and interestingly it, it for us it's a real mix of of those big institutional and also retail investors so we do have you know you and i and various other people that are you know individually invested through their share ices into that next energy solar fund so it makes it particularly interesting because i have conversations with you know super sophisticated institutional investors right down to you know someone who happens to live near to one of our solar farms and bought shares off, <laughs> off the back of van and, and nice. everything in between right so it's, it makes it really interesting and so that bit the public bit is a bit like um, and forgive me here for comparing you because no one likes to be compared, but a bit like Gresham House or Gore Street yeah, very similar, or Harmony yeah. because it's a public fund and anyone can go and buy shares. All right. Um, and so Next Energy Capital has grown very quickly. Um, so 250 people, yeah. something like that you said. Um, and you're in lots of different countries in the world. What's the vision for the company? Where are you guys headed? Yeah. What do you believe? So it's grown, it's grown massively. So I started when there were you know, five of us in a cafe in, in <laughs> London th- dreaming about this thing called Next Energy Solar Fund and it's, and it's grown you know, ridiculously over that period. So it's been do lovely, you, it's lovely to be part of that journey. I, until COVID, definitely. Now yeah. it's a bit shakier. We've had a whole bunch of new starters recently and, and, it's, and it's weird being back in the office because I now see people walking by, so I don't know. But we'll change that over the next six months, right? We're, we're a good sort of family business like that. Um, so uh, where are we going? So, so Next Energy has a, has a mission at, at the core of it. It's why it's a cool, cool place to work. So the founders of the business really truly believe in creating a more sustainable future through the nexus of renewable energy. So, so our whole mission was to get together and commercialize this cool idea of solar PV because we could see the potential, yeah. but we could see that the market couldn't. And, and we've been trying to build those bridges since. And that's really what, what we do as a business. So, so we've been one of the first in the UK to migrate from subsidies. So those feeding tariffs and the rocks that we spoke about earlier um, to what what's kind of called post subsidy solar. So building solar without any form of support so no contracts for difference no government subsidies no, nothing you in the guys, background you're there. building these right now you've we, built them we have already built a bunch of these we're awesome. building more we've got a massive pipeline of stuff in development at the moment which we will bring to the market over the next few years can i just clarify there so you're saying that next energy capital and others i imagine are now building solar that it's got no government subsidy no guaranteed revenues you can get you can you can raise the money and people are willing to spend the money on a solar asset just assuming that the sun shines every day and you're gonna take the prices and the prices are good enough. Yeah, correct. So so the the reliability of solar has proven itself, as we said already. So so the reason solar's established itself as part of the energy mix is because it's super predictable, right? There's very few moving parts in it. It's pretty solid state technology. You, it's not fire and forget, right? You have to look after it, you have to love it. Um, and you have to really know what you're doing to optimize it over time. But it's it's you know really predictable and, and therefore investors can get really comfortable with that. You obviously need to f- fight the argument of is there enough sunlight in the UK? But actually, you do that via a spreadsheet that says, well, you know, here's what it costs to build it. This is what it outputs. Yeah, economics tells you the answer to that. Um, and the UK is a great place to generate sun because it's not too hot apart from the last couple of days. It's not not generally too hot and that, that doesn't give you any performance issues. Um, so uh, I'm going to bank that one too. I thought so, really hot yeah, no, it's, would it's, be good. It's ironic, right? So, so solar actually gets less efficient the hotter it gets. So what you want is a, is a UK, Northern German territory. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? And then so, that, so the modules themselves get less efficient the hotter the surface temperature gets. But also the inverters obviously are running harder as they have to ah, cool themselves course, and you yeah. get more availability issues from that perspective as well. And then transformers and the like. So, so the whole so Sahara heat, heat is not, not great. The whole Saharan desert thing yeah, um, maybe isn't as good as it sounds. I mean, like everything, if you engineer it for the purpose, it's workable and there's no space limitations and all the rest of it. So you can cope with the, the inefficiency, but, but you have major dust issues dust getting into absolutely everything and 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 so on and 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 significant heat stress so it's not without its challenges i'm a massive fan of of putting solar wherever we can have it so you know my my future is you see solar on everything from your car to every single roof of of a building and every window is generating you know energy at the point of need rather than you know distributing distributing it across the country and so on that that's my 
my dream vision that if, if we could eventually achieve that, you know, within my lifetime, I'd be be super proud. So, like mid to northern Europe is the hot is the hot spot yeah, for great, yeah. soda. Yeah, yeah, here, Germany, places like That's that. Pretty fan, cool. Fantastic. It's good for wind. Yeah. Ireland with a great continental shelf. Apart yeah. from the floating wind people who we've had on the podcast, and they think we're good for that too. And yeah. I, I, I bet we are. Fair place to great be. for solar. Um, not so good at delivering nuclear, but we still not seem to so like good. it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of gas in the ground. It's not yeah. so bad here. Uh, it's great, yeah. It's, it's a good place to be an, o- be an asset owner as well. So the, the you know the underlying um, political environment, the economic environment in the UK makes makes it a good place to invest. Right? It's very very rare that the government does significant and touch wood retrospective change that yeah. harms in onward investment. So things like the windfall taxes that have been been talked about recently government has done the right juggling act of saying well actually if i do something here it will impact the future attractiveness for investors coming into this significant new wave of growth that we're trying to motivate to achieve our net zero targets so like there's always a complex beast there but the uk government's really good at not undermining the you know infrastructure investment so it's a good place to deploy capital as well as you know being a good place to generate energy as well it's kind of funny that we could go off topic here now but until recently i think that was true but now we have we've got a price cap so mm-hmm. you have um, politicians are weighing in on what the appropriate price is for a commodity, yep. which we don't, um, someone will tell me I'm wrong here, but I don't think we do that elsewhere. That's a, a political person deciding what, how much someone should pay for things and then the, the public purse picking up the rest, which is, is, is fascinating. Fa- fascinating. Yep. I, I don't know, you can build such a strong argument either yeah, side. Yeah, it's just, can, it's yeah. interesting that it's happened. And then the windfall tax, and there was mm-hmm. talk about the windfall tax going on renewables, which was mad. Yep, I'm absolutely. glad that hasn't happened. Yeah. Touch wood. So yeah, until recently, but we're starting to move in that ju- that general direction. But I guess that maybe that's a that's a conversation. So it's all, for it's day. all a nod towards market reform, isn't it? Which which yeah. we all know is coming in some way, shape, or form. I think contrary to to the, the environment being not you know good in terms of not undermining existing investment, I think we're pretty bad at making you know decent change along things like what's being what's been talked about in, in the, the energy market reform space where we're thinking about how's the ecosystem going to evolve over the next 20 30 years and how do we get a pricing model that works for everybody and makes energy more efficient and inspires generators to or, or investors sorry to still invest in an asset in a particular location because we've got an issue. like that's a very it's very complex mess, complex it? beast to try and unpick and we've obviously got the legacy of everything that's done to date so yeah, I don't I don't you know I don't underestimate the challenges we've got to, to overcome but then again you know going back to what I love working in this industry came in here to solve challenges that sort of challenge is, yeah. is, as, is a, as exciting as it gets right I think we're in the like the you've got to break if you want to make an omelette you've got to break a few eggs or whatever yeah. the phrase is I think we're in the eggs everywhere phrase at the moment feels like we've got people running around shouting nodal pricing <laughs> and yeah. we're all paying the marginal price for gas all these random things all going into the, the frying pan I've gone really hard at this, or whatever this is. Yeah. And now we're going to get the omelette. That is all. That's my thoughts. I, I like to think of it as well as you know that evolution of that ecosystem. I find super interesting. So just just add EV or electric vehicles into the mix, right? So thirty million cars in the UK. There's thirty million batteries going to be deployed in in various different locations that could do some really cool demand side response in the future. I mean that is a, that is a version of how we currently do things that I can barely contemplate yeah. how that then feeds into the mix. But what it will definitely be is exciting and there'll be loads of opportunity for, you know, creating exciting businesses and and, and creating interesting returns out of it as well. So are you guys looking at we're going well off topic but why not? You've got an E V, right? Yes. Before this have, you got yeah. a call from your wife about an E V yeah, charger. Yeah, yeah. So you got an E V. Yeah. Um, do you it, is the, the the company looking at EV chargers and the, is, is that an opportunity you guys are interested? So not in? not so much a sector for us on the on the EV side. Um, the, our our model is more about scale. So really, our focus is deploying the next gigawatt of of uh, yeah. of PV in in the UK space, um, and then it's also to to diversify that as well. So we are really interested in the in the battery space and how that works really well with an existing complementary generating station and also how that works on a standalone basis um, and how we weave that into a wider portfolio and how we think about evolving that portfolio out into the future. So I'm always talk in, in kind of two mindsets about storage. I really like the current business case around short duration storage, but I really welcome the opportunity that longer duration storage feeds into the mix of how we think about generating power. When you say short, do you mean like one hour? Yeah, kind of one one to four hour, I think is, is, yeah. is kind of in my mind where we are for, for short duration. And the longer stuff allows you to do, do you know, significantly more power yeah. shifting to times when you actually need the need the power so um i'm gonna ask you a couple more questions about next energy capital and then we're mm. going to talk solar and batteries right so next energy capital you guys um own these assets 
I want. I need like a tick, like a, a a tick box thing here. What do you do? Do you do you do you buy land? Do you get grid connections? Do you develop it? Do you get the planning? Do you build it? Do you negotiate the contracts? Do you operate it? Do you decommission it? What which bits do you all, do? All of all that. of it. All of that basically, apart from the buy the land bits. So we generally lease lease land from from farmers. So I like I like to think of, of of PV as an important part of how farmers are diversifying their business as well. So it's a it's a reliable income stream in a very unreliable world especially as we go through brexit and things we should definitely shouldn't digress onto um it, it creates a load of stability in their operating environment that, that will allow them to do really create more creative stuff to save the planet and they can then you know use the income from that to to start thinking about how they might farm more efficiently from a rewilding perspective and all loads of really yeah. cool beneficial na- na- nature-based solution stuff that, that's going to be going to be vital to our survival in the future as well so i like to think that's the starting point for me um but yeah, our third pillar of a business that I that I never got on to talk about is called Starlight, which is a development vehicle. So we literally do everything from concept right the way through the construction process into ownership. Then yeah. we do long term ownership, and then we think about repowering and decommissioning and all those those things out into the future. So I never really talk too much about decommissioning because my my own view is is you know we're acutely aware of what the constraints are in terms of achieving incremental growth in things like renewables out into the future. Um, grid connections is going to be a key component of that as we know so once something's a solar farm i'm pretty sure it's always going to be a yeah. solar farm at least for as long as you know i'm able to look at it it will look different right so it will definitely have a retrofitted storage and or hydrogen solution on it it will be more power dense as technology yeah. improves. like all this stuff will evolve but once that grid connections there it's, it's it's hugely valuable from an optionality perspective because it then over the assets life you can really start to be creative about what you do with that particular parcel of land okay and so, um, solar. I'm going to say something very triggering now um, on purpose, and um, please don't I leave love the room. This one. <laughs> so, uh, solar, according to right, the the creme de la creme of complexity in the power world is probably coal power stations, and then maybe gas CCGTs, um, and then then you get down to like um, other stuff. So, peaking plant. All right, it's quite complicated. You've still got to get gas connections to deal with. I'm going to get crucified for all this. And then the battery bit is quite complicated, mm-hmm. but it's like, but people see it as solar, but a bit more complicated, right? But you've got bi-directional inverters, you've got complex, more complex grid connections, bigger MBA swings. And then the bottom of the pile is solar, right? Because it's just trays in a field, yeah, it's easy, you get it? some sheep, um, and then you rake it in, yeah. and everyone's laughing. So isn't solar easy? So I think the industry makes it look easier than it is. I th- and, and there's a whole, interestingly, this is one of the reasons why we're migrating into battery storage space as well because actually we you know, a whole host of learning in that decade includes everything from how you how you construct realize procure components and then how you long-term asset own these things people have the opinion that you you know stick it in the ground you leave it alone yeah. and job done it categorically isn't like that right yeah. they need to be loved they need to be looked after they need to be optimized they they live and breathe like like everything right full of full of computers we all know what happens every time you go back in the office and plug your laptop in right i mean it's carnage for at least half an hour isn't it while you restart and do updates and so on so the, these things definitely need looked after and as they degrade you need to be on top of how performance is changing to allow you to think about how you're going to repower it in the future so we take a very different stance to a lot of our peers in the sector by being really active in the way that we manage our assets so we're looking at every single string so every single row of panels in every single one of our assets all the time and we have auto triggered alarms and we're looking at you know how data is changing over time to predict what's going to happen in those assets in the future to allow us to proactively change things and, and achieve availability in the future so can you put a solar farm in and and forget it well yeah you probably can and it will do well for a few years but its performance will degrade really rapidly and if you go and look at an asset that is unloved you can tell just by looking at the performance figures that it is unloved so if you're trying to extract maximum return for your investors over time and de-risk it for investors over time you really need to be super active with it and you need to understand that tech and it's complicated so i think that that does serve to to, to counter that argument a little bit um, i don't really believe that argument <laughs> obviously these things are bloody complicated they're really difficult to build um because there's loads of th- there's loads of stakeholders to keep happy and you've got to get it right yeah and it's a bit more complicated than leaving it obviously i just um i just thought i'd, I'd start down that route um because i had a feeling it would be a bit more complicated than that even <laughs> contracting for this stuff i mean how do you even how 10 years ago how do you contract to build a solar farm when no one's done it before yeah yeah we all got in a room and wrote the, the contract yeah right? it's, it's it's all that's why i say it's really interesting for us to migrate into the battery space because actually i see a lot of mistakes that were made in in those early days of solar being repeated in the battery space so 
you know, all of those learnings about, you know, what happens when you, you, you know, find a grid connection and you're able to secure planning for something and how do you then turn that into a physical asset? Yeah. And how do you do that in the middle of winter? Because you always end up constructing in the middle of winter despite your best intentions. And you have, you know, a bunch of contractors on site who've actually, because of demand, you know, oversold their capacity four times and, and are therefore unable to give you the resource in the timeline that you're expecting. You know, how have you made sure that what you're getting delivered to site is technically and from a quality perspective exactly what you wanted how do you make sure your warranties are right like we've learned all of this the hard way in in pv and i do see the battery storage space not having learned from those lessons so actually we are repeating a whole bunch of that stuff in delivery in in the battery storage space at the moment so from our perspective we think we've got a pretty unique opportunity to really bring those learnings forward and and we've got you know the development and the construction managers in our business that help us to 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 take our way through that that you know transitional period of of how do you actually realize it and it be the right asset for you to then own over the long term because a lot of the components are the same or similar right so you've got a grid connection you've got transformers you've got copper you've got cabling you've got civils you've got controls and instrumentation metering that's all kind of the same yeah and then you've got inverters which are a little bit different and the controls are a little bit different but still the same stuff right you're still cooling a big thyristor circuit with the needs a lot of, to get a lot of heat out of it and then um the bit on the end is different so you've either got battery cells or solar but it's on the dc side you've still got to run cables so there's a lot there's there's a lot that's similar yeah um you guys are building assets right now, aren't you? Or you, you either building one or you're building a few. Yeah, yeah, What's, where a few, are you yeah. in the battery world right now? So we're, we're also building our first utility scale um, standalone battery. So we've got 50 megawatts in construction up in Fife in Scotland. And cool. we're doing that with our partner, Eel Power. Um, we selected a, a JV partner t- to step into the battery space because we're super experienced in the solar space. We get batteries. We've actually had a couple of utility scale batteries in the portfolio <laughs> since 2017 predominantly be doing frequency response stuff, but we bought them in to learn the technology, learn learn a lot of those challenges around how do battery management systems work? How, how do we extract data? How does that integrate with the market? How do the contractual structure works and so on? So, so they've been a very useful kind of test bed for us. This is our first really strategic step towards that goal of bringing significantly more volume of storage into the portfolio over the next few years. And that's one of two work streams we're doing in the business. The other one is we're actually progressing with retrofitting a uh, storage solution to one of our existing solar farms so we've procured an import contract where we had export to the grid um, and we've gone through the development cycle and we're, we're just going through that kind of final technical specification phase to re- to realize that and that's first of a kind from our perspective and industry leading because we're interfacing that with a subsidized rock asset on a behind the meter basis so you've oh, got whoa, to think whoa, about whoa, whoa. what does that mean so, so you've got to think about how you are getting your power out of your solar putting it into your battery and then getting paid a rock on it or or getting a paid a subsidy on it as it's moving out into the grid. The, the and you've got to make sure you're not importing into yeah. the battery and pushing it back through the meter in order to game the rock game the game the incentive basically. So it's I mean, technically not necessarily that challenging to get that metering set up right, <clears throat> but from a regulatory perspective, super challenging. Nightmare. Right? So just to be, be, recap on this, so what we're saying is you've got a solar farm that's got a renewable certificate, a, a rock. Yep. Um, which so that's a subsidy it gets paid pence per kilowatt hour pound, Correct, yeah. pounds per megawatt hour oh sorry pence per kilowatt hour pounds per megawatt hour whatever it is it gets paid for every bit of electricity or power that comes out of that solar panel or through the to the grid and do you get metered at the grid connection on that yeah and so you, this is a problem that loads of solar is going to have right where you've got a feed in tariff or a rock I don't know how it works with feeding tariff, but we'll come to that in a second. A rock where you get paid, you get subsidised for that energy, and you want to. It makes sense for everybody in the world, for the climate, for everything, for you to put a battery on that site. Yeah. And so you want to do that, and this makes another headache, which is that you can't remind me how this how this works. We we'll probably need a diagram. So, you, but so you, you, you what you what you want to worry about is not importing into your battery, so you're not buying energy from the grid, and then pushing it back out through your rock meter. So you don't want to be getting uh, incentivised yeah. for something that isn't green generation which is entirely right right yeah, yeah. exactly the way it should be so it does create some complexity on the metering side but but it's entirely it it's entirely right yeah, yeah. So, you, so you end up with a with a, a kind of complicated metering setup in there which allows you to get to the net right position yes um but it's entirely right because going back to what we said earlier once it's a once it's a solar farm it should always be a solar farm and what we should be looking to do is make it as power dense as possible yeah. and as intelligent as a generating station as it can be so we're seeing some interesting stuff in the italian market at the moment where the government's actually promoting you repowering your assets so they, they're taking those traditional fixed tilt 
PV modules we've spoken about. So, so you know, traditional build, and they and they are allowing you under the subsidy regime to swap that for tracker. And the whole logic there, you think, well, that's insane, right? Because you're going to generate a load more energy with newer technology for an old subsidy. But actually, what they're trying to do is maintain that delineation between what's a what's a renewable power generating facility and what's farmland to ensure that you're not inefficiently building additional yeah. stations where you can actually use we need to do a lot more of this right because people think if you think about the site you, you and you don't include all of the additional transmission and distribution infrastructure that you'd need if you weren't using that connection to its full capacity you, you can get you can take the view that this is you know double dipping or whatever and blah blah, blah. but it's not right because for every penny that you get out of that grid connection you're not putting more overhead lines in Correct, or more yeah. yeah we really need to think on a, on a whole system level on that yeah, and it gets really interesting, right? Because, I mean, the future is probably having a battery and some form of electrolyzer on there to produce green hydrogen. And that becomes a really complicated mind melter of how do you how do you run all of that control? I haven't made my mind up on hydrogen yet. How do you stop containing yet. everything? No, I think it's part of the mix. I don't... Like I, yeah, I don't... I, I, um, big fleet. I don't big, know big, enough. Big fleet. I keep on reading. Every, every month I consume more and more stuff on this. And I keep on... I just haven't figured it out yet. Um, but like, there's lots of smart people out there who have, and I trust them. Yeah. Uh, but I have not figured it, figured I, it I think out it's, yet. I think it's inevitable that it's an important part of the mix. Yeah. Right? So aviation, you know, shipping, lorries, like doesn't make sense to do battery in that environment, does it? Particularly, especially like large scale, anyone, small stuff, it does. Um, and I think green hydrogen has got an important role to, to play in there in the future. I don't believe that let's feed it, let's replace our gas boilers with hydrogen fed boilers. I don't believe the infrastructure can cope with that. I think that's a bit of a myth, um, but it's another reason why actually it's cool being a generator because actually that changes changes energy demand in the future, which is which is kind of cool. Um, so I, I I I do think it does eventually kind of make its way into the I system. Trust, but I'm I'm in the same sort of boat, which is it's coming right. I can explain to to I couldn't do the Richard Feynman fi- talk to me like I'm a five year old thing and explain with maths how it all works, but I'm sure it will all figure itself out. Right? Yeah. I'm going to carry on doing the battery thing. So we talked about solar a bit. We talked about batteries a bit. So when you put them together, um, how are you guys making the business case work? So a few questions are, do you DC couple them? Do you AC couple them? Um, how do you see, is one de-risking the other or the other way around? Like, how, what's, the, what's the thinking behind putting them together? So again, it's evolving thinking. So, so eventually on new build especially, DC coupled is, is a really logical way to go. That market isn't quite there yet in reality. So there's a lot to talk about it. There's been lots of talk about it for the last couple of years. It's not really being realized <coughs> effectively at the moment and, and effectively meaning, you know, there are not sufficient enough realized cases to, to, to confirm that it's really bankable and, and, yeah. and really sustainable from a from an infrastructure investor perspective. But it will definitely come because there's a whole bunch of logic in there. So at the moment, it's all AC connected technology uh, and in the main what we're seeking to do is is sweat the grid connection as hard as possible yeah. in in the way that you're saying right that expensive infrastructure is there at the moment in in kind of simple terms we're generating we're using that connection when the solar is generating we're obviously not using it for the rest of the time why would we not use it you know as much as we can now what the colocate does is potentially curtail your battery business case so what we won't do so let me take another step back from there so traditional thinking in a subsidized asset is the best thing you can do is generate a, a a megawatt hour of energy that gets a subsidy and that you can sell the power on that's yeah. the best thing you can do whether you've got a battery or not so include a battery in there that that principle is still true yes. some nuance in there but let's 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 say that's right um so your battery won't ever curtail your solar and so you're not going to be switching your solar off in order to export with your battery you're always going to take this as, as a better optionality for you um, oh, so it does reduce your flexibility yeah. slightly within your battery relative to a standalone solution but you don't have the same infrastructure setup costs as you do for creating a new standalone battery so yeah, the, the two work in, in in tandem relatively well again i get really excited by by this concept of short and, and longer duration at the moment so short makes a whole bunch of sense at the moment um in in terms of our business case we see it as 
as, op- as, as an optionality that we've created throughout the portfolio of existing assets we've got and value add for our, for our investor base. Um, over time, I want to realize longer duration storage. So, you know, securing those import contracts for me creates additional optionality again, because once we've got that import and that export, there's nothing stopping us doing something more creative with that out into yeah. the future. So really, yes, short duration for today. Will it be short duration for the next 30, 40, 50 years? Hey, look, I, I don't know. We'll find out how that ecosystem changes. But I've got one eye on how we realize starting to what we call kind of shape shift to solar. So we're no longer generating in that that bell curve as the sun reaches, you know, peak at midday and, and off in the evenings and you're starting to create more like base load. How, how long does so, these solar sites last? So like the design life A of batteries time. is now... You say the inverters are going to last 25 years, 30 yeah. years, whatever. Is that legit? So um, solar modules themselves will, will do 40 years all day long. They just okay. get less efficient, right? So by, by the end of a you know, 30, 40 year operational life, they'll be 75, 80% as efficient as they were when you put them in the ground. So they still got Even a whole Even if you clean bunch. them and all that stuff? Yeah, they just degrade, right? They get degrade as they get exposed to weather and light and all yeah, the rest okay. of it. Yeah, um, uh, so there's 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 an argument to say we'll just leave it there as a less efficient asset and run it until it until it just gives up and and there's a whole host of arguments as to why you would and wouldn't do that including the repowering power density thing we talked about um inverters are 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 worked a lot harder and have a much shorter shelf life so so we usually assume about a 10 year life for a, for an inverter in a solar in a battery asset. oh in, in a solar, solar. yeah but i guess a battery Inverter is going to end up working harder. Shouldn't be massively dissimilar in in the life cycle. So you see a lot. You uh, see you a lot of like variable business cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in this space, right? Okay. And and a, and a lot of you know super racy assumptions will assume significantly longer life cycles. But the other thing about inverters as well is they're generally speaking modular as well. So what you're not doing is having complete failure of a unit and you're stripping it out. You lose a bit. Yeah. Instead, you lose a bit and you swap it out, right? So so you're you're more propping it up over an expected longer term asset life as opposed to doing a complete swap out at one point in time. And if you DC couple, mm-hmm. so you do, you connect your battery to your solar behind the inverter, yep. you don't have to buy as many inverters, Correct, right? Correct, yeah. Right. You have to buy a slightly different inverter, but actually quite a lot of the current solar inverters are, are shipped as DC ready. So you need some form of power converter couple on, but but that's that's it, right? You're, you're, you're literally just plug and play. Now, however, there are, again, complexities in there, right? Because you're distributing your inverters throughout your field, which means you're going to have to do the same with your batteries, yeah. which means you're not particularly well configured. It's maybe harder in place. So there's, and there's, also, there's if you're getting a rock on your main boundary meter, yeah, then uh, my electrical engineering yeah, hat is too. saying that, you know, you, to, you the control of that DC side is actually um, essentially a switch, right? Yep. <laughs> uh, and um, that's quite complicated. Definitely. This is quite a complicated technical it is definitely, problem to solve. It's definitely a very complicated technical problem to solve. If it wasn't, if you didn't have this subsidy, it probably it would be a lot, lot simpler. But DC, DC side, DC coupled, um, subsidy supported, co-located solar and ban- battery. Yeah, I've lost it myself. Is complicated <laughs> uh, without without yeah. a doubt, right? And 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 one of the reasons why I talk to the fact that you'll see DC in the new builds is because you haven't necessarily yeah. got that subsidy issue. So. There's a whole load of complexity to work through. Again, going back to why it's cool working in this space is is there's there's never a day that doesn't go by where someone puts a challenge on your desk and you just go, I have no idea easier. where I'm starting with that. Uh, but we always we always find a way, and and I always kind of laugh and joke about our own business and and say like if, if you can find kind of solar geekery anywhere that is more refined than in the next energy and wise energy you're doing really well right these guys can can tell you absolutely everything about an asset how it performs how it works and all the rest of it so we feel like we're really well placed to you know run forward with this stuff and then share our learnings with with industry which is which is what we we tend to do you know, we've, the we've sun gods a whole lot of this our, our ceo describes it as a snowplow so he likes to see <laughs> us run forward into this thing create a path and allow other capital to follow us into a space oh, that's a nice idea okay one last question mm. and then i'm going to ask you the one about you know what do you think about what, what do you think about the future so the thing you told me earlier which I, I, I kind of thought i knew but it's nice to hear it from you is that people are building solar assets unsubsidized mm. because they're going to take the merchant case, essentially. I'll take whatever price it is. And of course, right now, this summer, um, it's my assumption, well, my belief, I expect, and you can tell me, solar is in the money right now. Solar yeah. is, like, compared to the Excel sheets we had a few years ago. It pays to be a generator at the moment. It pays sure. to yeah. be a generator in solar, which is fantastic, right? I, just, I think this is a great thing. Um, but 
what are you managing to get institutional investors and debt and banks and all of that stuff on Merchant Solar yet? Because that so was a big challenge go, for batteries. Go back to that snowplow, right? So we're we're right at the start of that. We we so there's been a recent CFD, so contract for difference, put out in the market, which Solar has has benefited for. So a whole bunch of the new stuff that's coming down the line will also get some form of subsidy support in the form of that CFD. Well, you wouldn't want that right now, would you? You want well, CFD this summer. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, right. Yeah. So, so a bit long term contracted yeah, revenue yeah. stream, and also the recent clearing price was was pretty decent in the context of what's going on around energy security. So, there's a place for it, of course, right, because it's 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 bringing new capacity online. What we've been doing is working with our investor base to help them understand that transition. So, so it's taken us an awful long time. We started work on Merchant back in 2016, I think it was, and actually bought our first designed as Merchant. Um, asset or rather post subsidy we like to call it because merchants merchants a bad description of what you do with it but um, but call it post subsidy asset somebody tell me what um, the word merchant <laughs> means I've said this before it's flipping hell what someone in a sentence tell me what merchant means yes yeah, so that's why I always refer to post subsidy because what we don't do is spill power into the into yeah. the day ahead market we always actually sell it forward so we've got a sales desk who actually are wired into the power market and they're constantly selling it forward so we're actually we've always got these small hedges of power out into the future so I, I try to avoid saying merchant because merchant makes you think oh, about backing it. Let's, let's, um, let's, let's ban that word let's yeah, bur- burn let's all the books it, that say take it, it out yeah. of the equation yeah it doesn't, investors don't like it um, so uh, yeah we spend a lot of time creating the, the, the development case so, so we've been quietly developing a whole host of assets and then we've been taking investors on, on a journey um, <laughs> the UK infrastructure bank so the government's new um, spin off from the treasury that is designed to support new infrastructure projects has actually backed our new fund um, that is designed to bring investors into post subsidy solar, and it will be a whole host of you know long, short dura- duration contracted solar. So everything from corporate PPAs to you know maybe some CFDs, but yeah. also a whole host of merchant as well. And and really, what we've done is educate that investor base over that period of time on what does it look like, what does it feel like, you know, what are the downside risks, how has the business case evolved over time, and the benefit of solar, of course, in the in 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 this environment is the opex is really low in solar and really predictable, as we've said already. Yeah. So actually, what you're what you're really looking at is how do you think power price is going to evolve over time, and and so you, you then get into you know fascinating discussions about well, what does the short term look like? Well, is is the current energy crisis going away in the short term? <laughs> I mean, I, I can't see anything on the horizon that gives me comfort. It's it's going to disappear in the short term, right? Um, so so then you start thinking, well, what happens midterm? Well, we've talked about a few of those interesting things already. So you've got mass adoption of electric vehicle in a way we've never had before. I think society has now decided to step away from from ICE, step away from from the traditional way of of uh, of, of of mobilizing itself. You then get to well, what do we do about heating, right? And 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 there's going to be a drive away from gas boilers mainly you know, yeah. you know where are we going to go with that we've talked about the difficulty of feeding hydrogen into the gas grid and doing a simple you know change out of, of the way the, the boiler works so that probably means you end up with electric based heating as well so you know some form of ir infrared based or or, or um, air source heat pump based as well that has a massive impact on how demand works and that's yeah. before you start thinking about the recent 40 degree temperatures that are going to be more likely and people wanting to put air conditioning in their houses and various other stuff right so the demand profile is going to change fundamentally it's set to double within the next you know 10 15 years so being a generator is a great place to be in the context of what's coming ahead of you in the short and midterm the only thing that could really derail it is if we massively overachieve on our delivery ambitions for new technology so if we're able to do you know 60 gigawatts of offshore wind and and 50 gigawatts of solar in the next 10 15 years you're going to derail your business case to a to a degree realistically i like there are monumental challenges in achieving all of that infrastructure in the time. And I always talk to the same thing, which is the grid, but it's only one component of the challenge. But but, but you you know we're not realising that based on current investment in the grid, the 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 our ability as a country to realise that type of a project and to, to, to energise it into the grid as well. So you can get really comfortable over the midterm that, again, you're not jeopardising your business case. It's still a great place to be a generator. Like as a downside, though, mm. right? So the, you can see the capitalist um, seeping out of my body now <laughs> as I've said this. But like, um, oh, no, we overbuilt renewables. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. You know, oh, bugger. So that, that, that's a gen- <laughs> that is a genuine fear, right? Upside, so, so what it assumes money, is... Down- you know, yeah, I, I try not to take, a, I'm not a financier, right? But I try not to take offence on behalf of the financiers 
um, in in the room by so so that assumption assumes that you have no foresight as a as an investment manager and you're effectively looking at an investment you know is going to go wrong and you are so you know motivated to get it in the ground that you make the investment decision anyway and you hope for the best and you do that at scale now i know for a fact that is not the way our industry behaves and and actually um the, it, what what you'll see instead is an evolution of the business case so you're seeing it already with with you know battery storage being incorporated we've talked to hydrogen we've talked to you know things things creating demand building building at the point of need and all that type of stuff what i know is the the sector will change its operating model to ensure that that it doesn't effectively overbuild it will always find a use for that overbuilt power and monetize it it's not going to be a situation where we have so much additional power at the wrong time of day that it's going to be worth nothing and you've cannibalized your revenues and and then that that's before you get into that that conversation we had earlier about how the ecosystem changes in the long term so you get into uh you know those distributed batteries all the way throughout the country in 30 million batteries and then you get a whole host of what maybe 30 40 gigawatts of batteries by 2050 at utility scale in the grid as well look i mean the ecosystem's very very different and and we're probably doing huge virtual power plant things so my gigawatt of operating portfolio is probably a gigawatt power station rather than a whole bunch of smaller individual yeah. power stations and we're using our batteries to to you know compensate for the ebbs and flows and, and monetizing that way so yeah, I, I, I'm very confident that, that it, our current conservative assumption of how power pricing is going to give us interesting returns for our investors is super conservative, right? And, like and there's only upside in there. Either we're slower to build renewables and demand doesn't change as we expect and um, we stay in the same position and carry on burning fossil fuels. Either you get loads of volatility, power prices remain high and you've done well with your assets or... Um, we hit net, <laughs> or we hit net zero, and um, you get cannibalization. And we survive as a society. And we survive as a yeah. society. Win win, right? To be honest, it'll be somewhere in between, and everyone's yeah. gonna, hopefully it's all going to be all right. Um, but I, I, I think the cannibalization thing. I'm really bullish on peak demand in general. Yeah. I mean, I, I think our team will always uh, will say this about me. I, I believe that the electrification movement is going to be much, much bigger than people think. It is. So the, sure. you know, the, we currently have 50 gigs of peak demand. Um, we, I, I can see us being a lot, lot higher than that if we get like, mobility is completely checked. Air-based mobility, right? We're going off on one now. But if we get um, airborne taxis in the way that people are saying we will be by 2040. That, there's a lot there's a lot more energy than just driving around on rubber, right? Yep. And all of this stuff has needed to be electrified, but um, we're going to go off topic. And we've definitely <laughs> run out of time because Izzy the producer is, uh, if you, I wish you could see this, she's fanning the back of a camera. Um, and we're down to much. one. They're all back on. We've got a, we're fanning cameras. It's that hot in here. Right, we're going to leave it there. Ross, Great. thanks so much no, for coming Thanks on. so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, see you next time. Great, thanks cheers. very much.